So, uh, we have come to the uh, lecture 33. Uh, in the last lecture, I talked about um, uh, the, the effects of flooding till now we studied. Uh, one major thing we did in the uh, last uh, 10 or uh, 15 lectures is we have been studying the effects of um, um, trim, the effects of trim. Uh, we are finding out what are the uh, effects of trim, effects on trim due to a different uh, phenomenon. We studied how the trim of a ship changes. So, first of all, we studied the what is trim and we talked about the different um, factors that affect trim, mainly how the draft forward and aft are different and how it changes with respect to some phenomena that occur. The main few main reason for which is a change seems to be a change in the volume at any point. So, we talked about different conditions like a change in the density of seawater that produces a change in the volume, uh, removing or um, what we call as discharging masses or um, the um, adding of masses to different points of the ship uh, produces a change in the trim of the ship. And similarly, a shift in the uh, mass of the mass anywhere in the ship. For instance, if there is a um, shift in the ballast from let us say an aft tank, uh, third uh, aft tank to a forward tank, if there is a shift in the ballast or some fuel in some form that also produces a change in the trim. So, these all produces change in trim, we quantified these processes, we saw what are the different formulas and the mathematical expressions for um, the <coughs> a different processes like provided you are given the initial trim and some of the hydrostatic, uh, hydrostatic uh, data or hydrostatic uh, variables like MCT, MCTC. Uh, or uh, TPC displacement, the initial drafts, etc. Once you are given uh, the position of the center of flotation and once uh, its distance from the aft perpendicular. So, once you are given all these, once you are given all these parameters, you have uh, been given the different formulas for calculating the, um, the trim, the change in trim. And once you find, and we have already seen that we, we always talk about First of all, there is a parallel sinkage which we assume it to occur at the center of flotation and then which is very straightforwardly measured by W by TPC where W is the weight added. Now, once you have that change in uh, draft, change in the mean draft where the, which we call as parallel sinkage, it is followed by um, uh, the trim which is, a cha which is a ship going like this or like this and um, this uh, this we have seen what is the change in trim. Once you calculate the change in trim, total change in trim, how can we find the change in trim in the aft direction, in the aft point, how we can we find the change in trim in the forward point just by taking the ratio of, uh, ratios of similar triangles, the concept of similar triangles. So, we find the change in trim forward aft and once you find the change in trim forward, once you add the uh, from the initial draft you may add the change in trim forward and you add the parallel sinkage you get the final draft forward final draft aft. These are different things associated with trim and then in trim we also saw after trim we went into the concept of again dry docking how dry docking also affects trim and then we came into the uh, bilging process. Now, this bilging process is much more important in, in, in a way than probably even the concepts of uh, trim and uh, dry docking and uh, so we talked about how the uh, flooding can be uh, uh, measured by using uh, the methods of uh, the method of loss buoyancy or the method of added weight both of these methods will be can be used for calculating the um, the amount of the change in draft and uh, you also studied we also looked at how the there can be a change in the heel or trim again of the ship due to the flooding since flooding is a phenomenon that is unavoidable in nature uh, in real world which means any time you uh, commission a ship you are certainly uh, assuming that at some point or uh, other in the future the ship is surely going to come across a situation where it faces some kind of rupture some kind of damage as a result of which there will be um, flooding in some compartment and so it is very important that you 
be able to properly quantify what is the amount of flooding anywhere in the um, anywhere in the ship uh, what happens when there is a flooding anywhere in the ship and how it will affect the general characteristics of the ship now uh, so once you have flooding occurring flooding which we also call as bilging once you have this bilging occurring we these are all damage stability conditions uh, damage stability scenarios so once you have this damaged stability or when you have that we have seen using the method of bloss buoyancy how we can find the healing this will occur if the damage or the damaged compartment is not exactly center line but it occurs probably towards one side of the ship or in the uh, case when the damage is not in the midship section but uh, occurs towards one side whether it is a forward or the aft side then you end up with uh, what we call as uh, we what we have seen as trimming conditions now one possibility so uh, the only thing the only formula that you have to know to do this trimming condition is that uh, so in this this particular case when when one uh, end of a compartment for instance gets damaged the only thing you need to know is you need to find um, you finally you are going to use the formula the final uh, change in trim so we end up finally we are going to use the formula change in trim is equal to the moment causing trim divided by mctc now mctc will be given the moment to change the trim by 1 cm that will be given and so the problem comes down to finding moment to moment that is causing the trim and in this case uh, if you if you if you remember the discussion in the last lecture we have shown that um, it is important to remember that trimming always occurs about the center of flotation that is that center a line about which it pivots that uh, pivoting point is actually the center of flotation so at that point so at if you take the moments about so the way to find out what is the rotation is obviously to find out what is the net unbalanced moment acting on it um, so we find we take the moments about this pivot which is the center of flotation so in this ship if you take the moments we have seen from the previous figure something like this you will have okay it was a box shape vessel so if you assume that the center of flotation is somewhere here if this is the length of the vessel whole length of the vessel and if you have the center of flotation here then um, the net weight is going to act here somewhere here which is at the center of gravity this weight is what is causing the um, moment so <coughs> so the net moment causing the net moment is caused due to this weight which is w and therefore the moment caused is w into the distance between the center of gravity and the center of flotation which in this case we can write as something like this distance we are talking about this distance this so w into this distance let us call it small l this small distance l divided by uh, mctc will give you the change in trim change in trim so this c change in trim will be given by w into l by mctc so what you need to know is the weight of the ship and the distance between the center of gravity and the center of flotation for instance you might end up with a problem like this Um, so this problem states that there is a box of length 180 meters and breadth floating at an even keel uh, it is given as a draft now find the draft of the vessel forward and aft if the empty full breadth uh, compartment of build uh, of length 12 meter is built now what this says is that uh, the in this problem a compartment here if you look here a compartment here which is of length um, compartment of length 12 meters 12 meters what it says is that a compartment of length 12 meters gets flooded here now if you remember the previous class we saw that this distance between the center of flotation and the center of gravity will be equal to this length divided by 2 so it will be 6 meters so in this case l will be 6 meters and uh, now it's very easy the problem becomes very straightforward 
all you need to do is uh, so l is given w is the weight of the ship it is given i mean it's not written here but it's given the vessels displacement has to be given otherwise you cannot do the problem now once you have that and given the mctc you just find the change in trim then you find the so once you are given the change in trim so once you find this you go and do you go and do the change of trim in the aft condition that also we have done it is equal to the distance between the center of flotation and the aft perpendicular the distance between these two divided by l into the change in trim this will give you the change in trim aft and the change in trim forward change of trim forward is the distance between the center of flotation and the forward perpendicular divided by l into change of trim so you, using this formula you can get the change of trim forward and the change of trim aft now with the change of once you are given the change of trim you add it to the initial trim you will get the final trim but in add or subtract that is the only um, slightly confusing thing here that is um, so that is if you have the uh, means in this case you need to find out whether you need to add the initial trim or the change in trim to the initial draft or should you subtract the change in trim from the initial draft, that you need to check that is so what you need what is the easiest way to do this is uh, you can uh, see where the load is added for instance in this problem you can see that the ship is bilged in the forward it is given in the full uh, forward in this problem it is given the it is given here but um, it is that the problem is that the ship is bilged fully in the uh, forward compartment so if it is given that the ship is bilged in the forward compartment what it means is that this is fully bilged and uh, therefore if this is flooded it comes with automatic common sense that uh, you can immediately deduce that this must be sinking like this the ship at that point uh, okay the ship should be if the this compartment is bilged if this is filled with water then it automatically follows that this ship should be sinking like this so what do you do to get the final draft so the forward draft at any point will become the initial forward draft plus the change in trim change in trim forward so once you add these two you will get the uh, final draft forward on the other hand how will you get the final draft aft you have the initial draft aft you have the change in trim from the uh, aft draft you subtract the final uh, you subtract the change in trim aft you will get the final draft aft so each problem instead of following just the mathematics if this form this concept is followed uh, for instance just um, check that is you see where the weight is added you if a weight is moved from the aft to the forward for instance i mean i am not this is not dealing with uh, bilging in case of a simple transfer of weight when the weight is transferred from aft to forward it automatically means that the forward side will trim down its trim will increase that we measure we usually say the ship trims forward Chim, uh, uh, trip shims by uh, trims by the forward direction so that is um, and the reverse if the weight is transferred back or if a weight is added in the aft then the ship will trim by aft so it will go down at the back side so the draft here at the trim side uh, the back side will increase the draft there will decrease now the same thing actually it can come in mathematics as plus and minus if you are very careful that is definitely a good way of doing but each problem it is better to always like if you have the proper positive and negative you will get it as uh, sh should the ship trim forward it should the draft increase or decrease but the best option is always to follow the logic and say that uh, where is the weight being added you just check that where is the weight going is it going in the forward side or the backward side as, I mean or in case of bilging you say which side is getting bilged is it the forward side or the backward side I mean is the forward side or the aft side and uh, once you know that it is this or that direct uh, this or that uh, end then you decide wh whether it should go down or go up and similarly whether the change of trim should be added to the initial draft or subtracted from the initial draft so this is the way to calculate the bilging process and we have done most of the problems related to bilging 
using the method of loss buoyancy. Uh, as I have said before, uh, you have to note that there is no difference in the uh, final logic of the method two methods, both are following a similar trend of logic except that in one case weight is added, center of gravity shifts and the um, you assume that the total weight of the ship changes. Whereas, in the second method weight of the ship is not changed at all, With second method means method of loss buoyancy, the weight of the ship is not changed, the, uh, the center of gravity of the ship does not change, but the volume is lost from the ship, area is lost from the ship as a result of which I which is the moment of inertia of the water plane can vary and uh, the volume varies, the area varies. So, these calculations have to be borne in mind. So, these assumptions that go into doing either of the uh, method of loss buoyancy or the method of added weight, you have to have these the basic assumptions should be clearly in the mind when you are doing the problems, otherwise it is easy to make errors. So, this is it as far as mostly bilging is concerned and so in this lecture we are going into a I think we are completely uh, finished or wrapped up the section on trimming anything to do with uh, trimming healing also more or less um, and we are uh, now going into a uh, new into the final sections of dealing with regulations for instance. To, uh, today we will go into the different safety regulations and uh, uh, maritime laws and maritime regulations which deal with the different concepts of uh, stability parameters which say whether the ship is stable or not and uh, this different set of rules based on which different uh, classification agencies like IRS that is the Indian register of shipping or the American bureau of shipping or the bureaus veritas any of them or Lloyd's register all of them how they are they all have their own set of uh, rules um, adapted from a fixed set of code. Now, first of all there are some uh, standard codes from which they have adapted their own rules and made it more detailed and more fine tuned to their situations and to their countries. For instance, like Indian register of shipping has rules specifically made for ships in India, it is more tailor made towards that to, towards that country. So, like that we have, so what we will do today, uh, we have completely wrapped up the other sections on in a way most of the uh, real theory part on uh, stability calculations which we usually call as a statical stability curves, the dynamical stability and uh, the different um, uh, multipliers I means Simpson's multiplier, trapezoidal multiplier and, um, um, and then the different concepts of trim, healing and all that is more or less wrapped up and uh, we have come to an end of that and rest of it is uh, more more towards uh, laws and regulations and um, of course, some more parameters on waves and some resonance. So, we will uh, that is the rest of the um, lectures on. So, today we will go into what we call as the safety regulations, uh, some of the important regulations that are followed in different parts of the world. We will um, as I said before, we have a fixed set of rules that are given by the IMO. Okay, let us go into that. Now, uh, the main organization that deals with um, uh, the law governing is known as the IMO which is known as the International Maritime Organization. So, I will just read this. Uh, the maritime organization was uh, adopted in Geneva in 1948. Now, these are the people who deal with, so who deal with the legal matters, environmental concerns. Uh, maritime security, they are deal with even that, but their main work is to uh, uh, ru uh, frame rules leading leading to uh, the safety of ships, this one safety, this is their main thrust or uh, area of work, but they deal with all this environmental concerns which they what they mean by that is they call it as um, um, our purpose is to make a safe, um, safe shipping in a, a clean world, in a clean, uh, uh, clean oceans they call it the clean oceans and uh, so uh, the different things they are dealing with mainly they deal with IMO the international maritime organization. Um, so, they deal with it is based in UK in um, somewhere in UK and um, 
uh, it is a part of the United Nations organization, it is a, a branch of the United Nations, it is a council by itself and uh, they have about 159 or 160 um, member states, member countries right now and these all of them fr come together and all these engineers and uh, um, the engineers and scientists and the top um, uh, research people, they come together with the law making people or the uh, politicians, they come together to frame the laws to make uh, the <coughs> um, to make the shipping safer and uh, more efficient. So, this uh, these are the, this, so we will be dealing with the fr uh, uh, set of the framework of rules that are uh, um, fabricated by the IMO and what mainly it is the rules are initially fabricated by IMO and they have been adapted by different navies, mainly the US Navy is, I mean a US Navy, the UK Navy or the German Navy. Um, of course, these are the three main, since these are the three main, uh, three most powerful, one of one of the three most power, powerful countries, we will deal with some of the rules associated with them and we will see how the different criterion or the different problems that are faced by the shipping, uh, shipping industry as such, these people, how do they tackle it? How, uh, as you will see, most of the rules are very similar. There are no differences. There are not much differences, but um, slightly adapted for their country and for different, slightly different situations. And it's that just some differences in the way of approach. Now, usually they, uh, usually the ships are classified into many different types. You will see that uh, in general naval architecture, we call them as cargo ships, container ships, tankers, um, passenger, ferry then different types of um, um, like fishing vessels or you will have tugs, then you will have uh, mobile offshore drilling units and you can have um, uh, what we call as dynamically supported crafts, DSC, that is um, one special, class, special class of uh, crafts, crafts on its own. They are some kind of unconventional crafts, uh, the others are all what we call as conventional crafts. Now, <coughs> There are a, the rules, we have already seen some of the rules associated with ships, we have already seen some of the basic rules that uh, are followed um, in the, um, in the, in the few lectures in the middle, we talked about the different rules associated with um, car, uh, with the car or ore carriers, we saw how the ore carriers have their own rules and what are the conditions that are, um, that are important in dealing with these. Uh, safety of these ore carriers. We said grains, grains and ores, it, it was actually grains. So, grains and ores follow the same principle. So, grains and ores, they have a fixed set of rules on their own. We have seen what are the rules associate, how is the, uh, how the, um, I, how the shipping industry deals with the concept of wind, wind stability or the, uh, the resistance to wind or uh, how, do, how the, um, how the industry adapts, uh, how the industry um, meets this criteria, how it, how the, what are the conditions that the ships have to satisfy in order to satisfy the wind criterion. We have already seen how we took one distance as, if you remember as a, there was a healing arm developed as lambda 0 and we drew another healing arm at 1.5 lambda 0 and uh, we did some calculations similar to that. If you, and it is very important to remember that all these calculations all the latest stability rules are based on the concepts of dynamic similarity. And dynamic similarity again as we have already discussed many times is to do with the area under the GZ curve. GZ curve we have already drawn, it is very similar, it is very common, it is very, must be very, um, you must be very familiar with that by now. GZ represents the writing arm and uh, it is a curve between the GZ which is the writing arm and phi the heel angle. So, GZ phi curve is what we call as a statical stability curve and uh, if you do delta into GZ, delta is the displacement of the ship. So, a curve between delta into GZ and phi, the area under the curve is what we call as dynamic, stabi uh, dynamic stability. Now, dynamic stab the all the stability criterion are stability criterion dealing with dynamic stability. We st the importance of that was discussed many times, I uh, will mention it again, the importance is that dynamic stability actually represents the energy in that condition. Now, 
delta is uh, a weight and um, um, or it is a force into g z there is a distance moved. So, it is like work done or energy content. So, it is the energy content and so what are we assuming when some energy some form of energy is coming into the system some form of perturbation what we call as perturbation pert perturbation to the stability some kind of um, um, some kind of uh, force or some kind of phenomenon that is acting to remove the stability of the system some kind of energy is input into the system to remove the stability. Now, when that goes into the system how the ship reacts to it or the how the how if that much energy goes into the ship how the ship reacts without capsizing or without any permanent damage to the ship. So, this is the concept of stability this is how we deal with stability that is why this concept of dynamic stability, stability is very important because it does not matter whether even if the wind is in a gust all we are concerned about is the total energy in that gust and if that energy goes into the ship if the wind hits the ship and the energy goes into the ship or the wind does work on the ship again which is like energy going into the ship what will the ship do. So, the ship heals will it go beyond some value such that it becomes unstable and capsize or will it stay in a will it come back to its original position. So, it is whenever we are talking about dynamic stability we will be dealing with area under the writing arm and healing arm curve between the writing arm and healing arm curve that area under that that area is what provides the dynamic stability and that is what gives you the um, decides whether the ship is stable or not. Now, based on that background we will go into some rules that are very important the first of which is the set of rules dealing with passenger ships. Um, now, some of as I have said before it is always like this. Um, so, you have the phi curve that is the heel and you have the g z curve and so let us suppose that you have a curve like this. So, this is what we call as the and delta into g z if it is instead of g z if it is delta into g z this curve becomes a the area under this curve becomes the uh, sta uh, dynamical stability. Now, always we draw the healing arm as well. Now, the first rule of passenger ship says that between 30 degrees and 40 degrees. So, this is 30 degrees 40 degrees the area under the writing arm curve this area this area should never be less than it should not be less than this is I will write it here it is called dynamic stability it is should never be less than that means it should be greater than uh, 0 0.055 meter radians. So, as you can see the unit of the dynamic stability is uh, either meter radians or um, tons meter radians. So, if you this is obviously in terms of g z curve because it is meter comes from g z and radians comes from phi it is the area under this curve. So, this is just this is dynamic stability would be 0 0.055 delta where delta is the uh, weight of the ship. So, this is general it says that the dynamic stability per weight of the ship dynamic stability is actually delta into that. So, this the it says that the area so it, we cannot say exactly dynamic stability, but the area under the g z curve this area which is between 30 degrees and 40 degrees should never be less than 0 0.055 meter radians that is the first rule associated with uh, the passenger ships. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry it is not like that. Uh, the, uh, this area the area this area sorry slow I made a small mistake here uh, the area up to uh, 30 degrees um, uh, area up to 30 degrees should not be less than 0 0.055 meter radians and area up to 40 degrees should not be less than 0 0.09 radians meter radians and this is the rule and um, between 30 and 40 this area between 30 and 40 this area should not be less than point uh, not 0.3 meter radians. So, the rule says that 
So, the clearly the, uh, the, the, the rule for this is the IMO rule from, for uh, uh, passenger vessels. It, so, the rule is that between the uh, angle of 0 degree and he, when it heals between 0 to 30 degrees within that angle of heel, uh, that writing arm curve should be such that the area under the writing arm, area under the GZ phi curve should be greater than 0.03 meter radians up to 30 degrees and between as and from 0 to if it heals up to 40 degrees between 0 to 40 degrees it should be uh, at least 0 0.09 meter radians and also between um, 30 and 40 also it is important that there be at least a margin of 0 0.03 meter radians. So, this is the um, these are some of the this is very important as far as rules this is in fact is the backbone from which all the different rules associated with dynamical stability for different excuse me. Um, so, the different dynamical stability for uh, different types of ships modify from this, this is where it starts from. So, it is also important that the, uh, the metacentric height gm0, any sh gm0 is the metacentric height of the ship you know that it has nothing to do with the angle of heel, it is 0, it is in the intact condition. So, gm0 should always be uh, greater than 0.15 meter radian, 0.15 meter. So, this is the uh, metacentric height. So, the rule says that the metacentric height of the ship should always be greater than 0.15 meter. Now, as we have already discussed, when you keep increasing the metacentric height, um, because this is an important thing we have already discussed. One thing that definitely should go home, you should take home with you after the end of the whole course, that is that the stability of the ship is in general measured by its metacentric height. And when you say that the metacentric height is large, you are in general saying that the ship is stable, more stable. And so, we have said that uh, and the moment metacentric height becomes negative, uh, that is a case when G or the meta center M goes below G, you say that the ship has become unstable. And so, uh, G M, it keeps becoming more and more positive, the ship in turn becomes more and more stable, that is true. But we have already seen that we cannot make it too large, because the ship, uh, the ship becomes too stiff to its uh, rolling. So, when the ship rolls, it rolls like this, if it is too, if G M is too high. So, we come to a case of uh, we come to a situation of compromise between these two extremes of um, large GM and small GM, somewhere in between you try to bring it. So, the optimal GM which IMO has come up with is says that the GM 0 of the ship which is the initial metacentric height should not be uh, less than 0.15 meter. So, 1.5 meter is the, it is true for all kinds of passenger vessels irregardless of their uh, dimensions. So, whatever be the dimension of the ship, whether it is 100 meter long ship or whether it is a uh, 50 meter long ship, whatever it is, its GM0 should always be less than 0.15 meter. So, this is the uh, one important rule associated with the uh, passenger vessels and it is in general recommended that, uh, that the, <coughs> the, it is also recommended that uh, the maximum value of uh, GZ which is your writing arm, the maximum value of a GZ should occur at a value of heel angle which exceeds 30 degrees. So, you are not, they do not prefer you to have heel angles less than 30 degrees for their maximum GZ. So, the position where you get your maximum GZ in your curve like here, this curve if you look at this, this is where you are getting your maximum GZ. This should always occur at an angle exceeding 30 degrees. So, somewhere here you should have the maximum. So, this, these are some of the basic rules from which all the series of regulations associated with the different kinds of vessels, cargo, container or everything of course, modified for that particular case, but this is the basic structure from which it is. These rules I think you should definitely uh, keep it in memory and definitely keep it by heart. It is it's something that is definitely important uh, as a result of this course, you should know this. Okay. Now, so, once you have this basic set of rules, uh, these are rules associated with uh, the, uh, the IMO that is a maritime organization. Once you have these rules, there have been 
of uh, of course it's these rules are framed mostly by and by uh, the 150 organizations that go together to comprise the IMO in which more it's a fact that most of the uh, work is done by US, UK, Germany and a few of the western nations they are mostly instrumental in developing all these codes. Now, so they, they have slightly sometimes slightly modified versions of this IMO codes. So, we will look at some of these important important navies which have their own set of codes, they have developed their own set of codes. So, the US Navy for instance have a couple of rules mainly um, there are of course, the, it, the whole uh, book dealing with these regulations maritime regulations is vast there is many it deals with ballast, it deals with environmental concerns, it deals with passenger safety, it deals with fire, the lighting of uh, possibilities of fire uh, eruption everything it deals with everything. But we in this course are in since we are a course uh, this course is devoted to uh, st stability concepts hydrostatics and stability. So, we will we will say that we will focus on those aspects of the code stability codes. So, like we did with the dynamic stability we showed the uh, we showed the uh, the rules associated with that. So, we will deal with the stability concepts associated with wind healing we have already given in some previous lecture we have already told I have already described how the the whole set of calculations is done. I will just mention here the different laws associated with it. So, you have wind healing is a possibility and you can have a healing due to turning means when the ship tries to turn it can end up with a healing that is a healing possible. Uh, and uh, whenever you have cargo handling cargo handling means you shift a cargo from one point of the ship to another either from the port to starboard side or from the forward to the aft side whatever kind of transfer it is it will produce its own healing. So, a healing moment is generated due to the transfer of cargo does not have to be cargo it can be the passenger as well. So, the transfer of passenger also uh, produces such a healing. So, these are the different <coughs> so these are the different types of uh, healing moments possible and uh, each of these navies in fact have their own laws or rules associated with how to handle these kind of problems. And the basic rule for wind we have already given I have already explained to you how the wind is done how I explained that lambda 0 1.5 lambda 0 and uh, how we assume that the whole energy has gone into the ship and how long the ship will continue healing with that energy input into the ship how long how much further will it heal like that I have already discussed. And turning I have mentioned the basic formula of turning healing also and um, some passenger healing we will take a look at now. Now, for turning if you I mean I, I mentioned this already, but what happens in the case of turning is. Um, so, uh, in case of turning what really happens is that you have um, a force acting and you have a uh, moment caused due to it. So, what happens is that when the ship tries to turn in the uh, in its centroid exactly at the point of its kg you will have a centrifugal force acting on it. The centrifugal force is given by you know m v square by r delta v square by r where r is the radius of turning. So, um, so this will give you the <coughs> the moment that is acting to turn the ship this gives you the force that is acting on the ship that is the centrifugal force. Now, how do we find the moment? So, once the ship is trying to turn, so this centrifugal force causes the ship to it acts on the center of gravity and causes the ship, ship to shift in fact. So, the water in fact provides a reaction from the the water provides a reaction it tends to cancel the effect of this centrifugal force. So, the centrifugal force and the reaction from the water will cancel each other out and uh, the ship in fact does not uh, really slide or uh, shift in that fashion. So, and the vertical distance between the sh uh, the centrifugal force and the um, center of action of the reaction force from water is kg minus T by 2 where T is the draft. So, T by 2 is the point where the water reaction it can be assumed to act and the centrifugal at kg. So, kg minus t by 2 is the distance. So, centrifugal force the forces are the same. So, two forces acting and it produces a moment turning into heel. So, this is the 
so v0 squared by r into kg minus t by 2 roughly gives you the um, the net moment acting to turn the ship. Now we can do some instead of putting the velocity of turning you can convert it by some uh, shipping uh, you have some shipping statistics you can say how you can convert it to v0 which is the forward velocity of the ship l is the length of the ship into 0.02 it is just some ship statistics. So, it has nothing to do with physics as such. So, this will give you the regular this is give you the momentum uh, the moment produced moment trying to turn the ship this is m t. Now, of course, this moment is provided by the rudder in turning the ship. So, the rudder provides that moment and the ship turns. Now, the rule the rule associated with this is that this. Now, it is very important that um, the angle of heel does not exceed 15 degrees. So, we say that Now, it is very important that the ship does not heel beyond 15 degrees as a result of turning. Whatever be the radius of turning, you are not allowed to take a turn that is uh, more dangerous than uh, producing an angle of heel of 15 degrees. Then, uh, heeling arm. Uh, now, note that uh, the moment divided by the weight of the ship delta uh, will give you actually in this, I believe this is not empty as such in this. Uh, this actually represents the healing arm not the uh, moment to turn. Moment to turn should have a delta in it that is your weight of the ship. So, once you take that m t divided by delta it becomes this quantity which is actually your healing arm healing arm. So, m t divided by delta that is which we call as a healing arm in turning so the healing arm in turning should be uh, less than 0.6. So, the healing arm in turning um, <coughs> 6 meters 0.6 meters. So, healing arm in turning should be less than 0.6 meters. So, these are two important rules associated with the uh, moment uh, with the turning then um, there are some forms of rules associated with what we call as dynamically supported crafts. Now, since most of you are not familiar or not very familiar with naval architecture as such. Um, dynamically supported crafts are crafts that have uh, some other form of support rather than just the buoyancy force. You know that in case of ships, uh, ordinary ships or conventional crafts which we talk about like uh, of any kind of uh, container ship or cargo ship con tanker or any boat, the weight of the ship, the weight of the boat or ship is balanced by the buoyancy force from the uh, water. So, this is the Archimedes principle the weights balance the weight of the ship is balanced by the buoyancy force. So, this is the basis on which ships float ordinary conventional ships float it is the Archimedes principle upon which it floats. Now, it and uh, it is possible that there are some other ways of um, actually balancing the weight of the ship rather than um, rather than just a just the buoyancy force for instance you can put different kinds of hydrofoils in fact in the next lecture i'll give you some pictures of hydrofoils hydrofoil boats uh, these are kinds of boats which have hydrofoil is the hydrodynamic equivalent of an aerofoil so those who have familiarity with some aerofoil concept aer aerodynamics concept you have will be familiar with what is known as an aerofoil uh, especially for those who have done some hydrodynamics or aerodynamics you will know what is an aerofoil. So, there, is, there are flows over aerofoils it can produce lift you will if you deal with if you study that a little bit you will see that there are different ways in which flow over an aerofoil can produce lift it is due to uh, just quickly I will mention it that is this represents if this represents this is a basic structure of an aerofoil and a hydrofoil is ex very similar in shape. So, we can say that this is a hydrofoil. So, this is the shape if you call this to be the shape of a hydrofoil 
what will happen is that you bring an air like this, uh, if the air stream comes like this, so this is a structure which remains like this and some air comes like this or in our case we are talking about hydrofoils, we deal with water, when water comes like this, uh, when it will come at some angle which is known as an angle of attack and this will produce because of the air which flows over the hydrofoil and below the air or water which flows above the hydrofoil or below the hydrofoil, uh, this fluid because of the difference in velocities of the fluid, differential pressure is created here and here. So, this region will end up with a higher pressure, uh, sorry lower pressure, sorry this is minus and this is plus, lower pressure and this region ends up with a higher pressure. And um, so, this is a negative pressure and this is a positive pressure which we call as and this side we usually end up calling it as the pressure side and this is known as a suction side or the phase and back whatever you call it and one side is at a higher pressure, one side is at a lower pressure. You know that when there is a when any system exists in a continuum such that there is one side higher pressure and one side lower pressure, there is a tendency for a force to act from the region of high pressure to a region of low pressure. So, in this case there will be a tendency for a force to act like this. So, from this high pressure to low pressure force will act, this force we call it as a lift force. So, this concept of lift force. Um, so, this concept of a lift force comes into play in the case of a hydrofoil craft. So, in the hydrofoil crafts because of the high speed in which it moves and the way in which it is designed because of the shape of the hydrofoil and as such, uh, it will produce a lift on the hydrofoil because of the circulation generated it will produce a lift on the hydrofoil. Now, this lift in fact tends to um, lift the let us call it a ship itself or a hydrofoil craft, that hydrofoil craft is lifted up as a result of this, um, this hydrodynamically generated lift. So, it is due to hydrodynamic forces and not exactly due to buoyancy forces, that is the difference between a uh, ordinary craft, a conventional craft and a unconventional craft which we call as hydrofoil boats or hydrofoil crafts. Um, so, um, even a hydrofoil crafts or a so, these kind of vessels are what we call as dynamically supported craft, it is supported by dynamic forces rather than static forces. Buoyancy is a static force because it is just due to the uh, volume underneath, whatever is the volume un underneath and it is a static force. It has nothing to do with the velocity of the ship as such, it has nothing to do with the dynamics or hydrodynamics, it is only hydrostatics, it is purely hydrostatics problem. Now, therefore, uh, this is the uh, this is what we mean by a dynamically supported craft. Now, even a dynamically supported craft can have two modes of operation, we say that it can operate in two modes, we can uh, it can be said to be operating in a displacement mode or it can be said to be operating in a foil bone mode or a foil mode. The difference is the two methods I have already said, if the uh, DSC that is the dynamically supported craft, if the DSC operates purely using the concept that it is weight equals buoyancy. Archimedes principle, if it follows that concept then we say that the ship is in a or the that craft DSC is in a displacement mode. If the ship operates such that its uh, weight is now balanced by hydrodynamic forces which are coming due to the lift due to the hydrofoil concepts, we say that the ship is operating in a foil bone mode. So, this is in general. Um, some basics about uh, dynamically supported craft. Now, there are some specific rules for such, there are very many set of rules associated with such crafts mainly because they travel at faster speeds and are more likely to be and or they are more susceptible to um, accidents or uh, disasters in fact. So, there are lot of rules associated with that. Uh, some of those rules we are not giving right now, but um, please remember that these are some rules, there are some special set because we cannot mention all the rules in the short time that we have. So, we will 
uh, we will um, we will broadly mention that there are a lot some similar these rules that we have already specified for uh, the uh, other type of crafts that is the um, uh, like we said for the passenger vessel we have given a set of uh, rules associated with the dynamical stability. Now the same set of rules can be there are some rules adapted like that for dynamically supported crafts as well and um, these are some of the rules associated with the US Navy. Now they have their own set of rules associated with uh, wind healing for instance. Um, that is an important thing. Now they the no I think I will go back to this. Now the U US Navy they also have their own set of rules associated with the uh, wind the US Navy specifies that the wind lever the wind lever which we call it as the the healing lever the wind is associated with, it is usually given as PAZ by 1000 G delta. Um, so this so in the previous definition sometime back when we did the wind healing arms we talked about the general IMO rule which is how the IMO generally states uh, which is the way in which IMO generally uh, calculates how the wind stability we say whether it is stable or not. Now the US Navy has a slightly slightly different way of dealing with the wind healing arm. US Navy has a slightly uh, different way of dealing with the wind healing arm and um, what so we will go into that. Um, so first of all what they say is that the wind lever or the healing lever healing arm is given by this formula P A Z by 100 G delta. I will tell you what each term is. P is a is usually defined as a wind stress and it is given a constant value of 540 Newton per meter. The meaning of this is this is something like a very high value which is the maximum for instance that the ship can experience in the most uh, violent weathers usually the most violent weathers come in regions of North Atlantic and in the Baltic Sea somewhere in those regions you have the most fierce winds and most powerful winds which produce the most um, dangerous conditions. So we say that P we assume in this P is assumed to be about 540 Newton per meter square this is the wind stress. Then A is a particular is a characteristic of the ship it is the windage area. It, which means the area in the ship which is exposed to wind there is it is not just the total area it is not important it is a projected area. So if the ship is like this and let us assume that some region of it is above the water and if wind acts like the wind acts from this direction it comes here this area which is above which is projected onto this plane. So this area this area does not matter it is only this area that matters project this area into this plane you get the uh, windage area. So that is known as A that is a windage area. Then um, Z is the distance between the centroid. So if you have the windage area here the centroid of that windage area to the uh, T by 2 you know T by 2 means again the concept is this the wind acts at the centroid of the windage area it can be assumed to act at the centroid of the windage area. The reaction from the water here can be assumed to act at the T by 2 half the draft means the total force is acting over the whole draft and the, if the force is constant that force can be assumed to be acting at the centroid which is at T by 2. So the distance between uh, this centroid of the windage area and the and T by 2 that distance is Z. So Z is that distance G is the, cent, uh, G is the acceleration due to gravity and delta is the displacement displacement of the ship. So once you have this you end up with the wind lever. So you get the wind lever and there are now a couple of formulas which give you what are the stability criteria and how the role of the ship is calculated as a function of this lever that uh, since we are out of time now we will continue with that in the next lecture. So we will stop with that today. Thank you. Mm -hmm.